how we All right, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to our last, uh, whatever we're calling these things, master classes and talks. Um, as I think everyone knows, the next event is the final one on August 29th. Um, we, unfortunately, I think the um, Bruno Walter Auditorium, where we were hoping to have it, is getting new seats that day. So we're going to be across the hall in the after gallery, most likely. I'll send you more information about that. But it's got the head shots of it up right now. Um, and we'll actually still have that, but we'll move the cases to the side, and it should be a nice space to, to show things. Um, I haven't quite got all the, uh, the guests lined up for that, but it will likely be some Broadway producers and maybe a couple of writers and company people, um, just to give you feedback. Um, OK, so uh, today, of course, we have uh, uh, Jen Tepper and Jason Robert Brown uh, talking about composition. Um, you guys want to sit down? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody uh, knows both of these people very well, but uh, Jen Tepper is still the director of programming at Christopher Blow and uh, the author of that uh, those wonderful Untold uh, Stories of Broadway book. If you haven't read them, you should. You have them at the library, um, but you should also buy them. Um, and uh, Jason Robert Brown has written lots and lots of fabulous shows, including Urban Cowboy and uh, 13 Honeymoon in Vegas, um, Bridge of Madison County. Anyway, you know them all. Um, so I will. Uh, I'm sure you already know a lot of things about Jason's work, but I also wanted to mention, because it might be interesting to talk about today, that of course, in addition to being a writer, he's also an arranger, an orchestrator, a concert performer, a director, literally every multi-hyphenate you can think of. No, um, no, that's not true. <laughs> I can think of some. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll cover that maybe. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's right now working on a lot of new projects that I think we'll talk about as well. One of them is the stage adaptation of A League of Their Own, which is really exciting. Um, as well as uh, the Prince of Broadway, which is going to Tokyo, which you're the music supervisor. Is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so lots to talk about, both past musicals and new. Um, and the first question I wanted to ask is, can you just tell us how you got started as a writer of musicals? Um, uh, my, uh, well, you know, I would, it, musicals were sort of just part of the, the world I grew up in. I, you know, I, I, it was just a nice uh, suburban Jewish uh, household outside of New York, but um, we, uh, you know, there were cast albums and things like that. So I remember when I was a kid, I would take the cast album of West Side Story and I would put the needle down, needles, right, right, right. Uh, and you know, and I had the libretto that I got from the library, and so I would sit with the libretto and I'd put the needle down, and I'd say, "Oh, and then I'd okay, do that. Um, so, uh, so I did a lot of that, and, every, and whenever there was a cast album that actually had a libretto in the library, I would take the libretto and I would then do that with the cast album. Um, so that was sort of that, but all along I was playing the piano and I thought I was going to be Billy Joel. I mean, I, I, I thought I was going to be a, a, you know, a rock and roll guy, which I, I, I guess I sort of am, but I, you know, it, the musical theater stuff just turned out to be a much, I, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan of being a big fish in a small pond. I, I, I don't like big ponds, they make me anxious, so I, uh, I, I don't think I was ever going to really be a big rock and roll guy because the pond was too big. So I, I, I found smaller ponds, which were the musical theater ponds, which, as you all know, are very small ponds filled with exceptionally uh, rapacious sharks. <laughs> no one is ever so quotable, so, you know, at 10 a.m., so just... <laughs> um, what was the first musical that you wrote, you know, was it as a teenager, the first actual full-length kind of musical? Uh, well, I don't know if it was full-length, because I never saw it performed, for, and, and everyone is uh, better for that. Um, there was, a, I, I think when I was 11 or 12, I wrote a thing when I was at summer camp, and I remember writing it. Um, I had a yellow stationary paper my mom gave me to write letters on, which of course I never 
did. Uh, but I, I did write my entire musical on, on those. And I, I mean, I, I performed it myself all the time for all of my friends. And I would say, wait, wait, come hear my show. And I, so I mean, I think it must have been about 25, 30 minutes long, something like that. Uh, but then I actually, at French Woods, I did write an entire show when I was 16, uh, which was called Innovations. And it was about the silent film uh, business, which I have no, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I did that, and I orchestrated it. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we, we did it, there was tap dancing, and there were showgirls, and there was all sorts of things. It was, and, it was, and it was very dark, and it ended up with somebody getting bricked up behind a wall. And it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was the stuff, so it was terrible. And um, so that was, I guess, my first real show when I was 16, but even that one wasn't real. And I kept, as you do, I kept revising it uh, for the rest of my life. I, I, you know, I think it took me until I was about 24 to really say, oh, come on, I'm not writing innovations anymore. Put it away. Uh, but that was a, a good solid. My entire college career, I was always off in the side saying, Oh, I have a new idea for a song. I have a new thing. Nothing ever. Came None of that is, you know, we haven't heard any of that. I mean, you probably have, in that there are phrases that were just so ingrained into my fingers and into my voice for all those years of working on it that they have wandered into the other shows. It will be interesting if I ever take out any tapes or scores of, of that and listen to them. It will be interesting to see what sort of filtered its way into my other work since then. Um, so Songs for a New World, which we all know, if the one or two people who don't know it go by the cast recording as soon as you leave here, um, you know, you have to. Uh, it, it really seems to have inspired, you know, a new generation of song cycles. It really was the first of its kind in a lot of ways. Um, do you feel that way? Do you feel like what you guys did has kind of affected the playing field for new writers and song cycles? I guess, uh, you know, Songs for a New World comes very clearly to me out of Closer Than Ever, which was only, you know, five years before or something like that. I, you know, I saw Closer Than Ever, I guess that was 89 or 90, uh, and I saw it, I was on a trip here to New York uh, at the Cherry Lane, and, and I loved it, and I'd never seen anything like that, a sort of cabaret review, you know, I was 19, I hadn't seen that sort of thing, that sort of sophisticated New York thing where all these people would you know, say witty <coughs> aphorisms at each other while music was playing. And so I, I uh, so Songs for the World really grew out of that. It just, it was much more of a sort of whatever my particular theatrical aesthetic was. It wasn't so much of a cabaret show. And you can see places where I was trying to write a cabaret show. Stars in the Moon clearly is me trying to write a cabaret show. And then there's things like the Christopher Columbus stuff that are clearly not that, and, and all of those piled on top of each other. Um, you know what? I, it's, it was a very tricky piece, and it's not like it was a, an especially successful piece as far as the critics were concerned, or even, you know, as far, the, the cast was amazing, and so I think the audience really went for the cast, but I think a lot of people left the show going, what, what was that exactly? I, you know, I mean, boy, the, the, some of that music was awful swell, but what, what was that thing? Uh, but Daisy and I really did think it was a, a, a very specific thing, and uh, I'm not sure how well that ever gets communicated because, of course, it was only we did it 28 times and that was the end of it. So it's it's been sort of left to everybody else to interpret what those 16 songs are and why they're in that order and why they're those four people or why they shouldn't be or whatever else that was. So I I think of it really less as um, the this thing that Daisy and I did that had any influence. That really it was just this record that people listened to record. <laughs> Uh, that it was this CD that people heard, or these MP3s that people heard, that that changed sort of what they thought they might be able to pull off with theatrical music, you know, uh, and uh, and so I, I'll I'll take credit for that, and it wasn't that I was even trying to do anything all that new or interesting. I just I was 24 years old, and that's what I sounded like, and um, and nobody else who was 24 years old had that record come out at that point. So I you know I I think I got. I, I got lucky to land when I landed and to get the record made when we got the record made and to do the show with that cast of people. And it was all, it was very special, but it, it's, it is weird. I, I hear that it's very influential and I hear it, but I, I also think, but nobody saw it. I mean, it, 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 you know, it was, it was 28 performances and, and the theater did not have as many people in it as are here right now. So it was, uh, it was, it was, it was weird. <laughs> Um, at that point in your career, and now also, it's um, do you find that doing the other things you do, arranging, orchestrating, music that isn't yours, does that feed what you're working on in certain ways? How does that intersect? Um, it does, but not as much as it used to. It, you know, first of all, the, the importance to me of doing the arranging and the conducting and the, the orchestrating 
Uh, I happen to I happen to like doing. I'm not sure I like orchestrating, but I happen to you know I I I know how to do it, and I think I do it pretty well. But it was really I needed to get the bills paid, and even at this point in my career, I still need to get the bills paid. And being able to do musical things helps pay the bills because you can essentially speak another language that everybody else can't speak. Just being able to write down somebody's songs turns out to be like this massive thing that you know because anybody can just sort of write a song and. You know they can't write it down, and who are they going to call Ghostbusters? And so, I, uh, <laughs> so that was always useful uh, to be able to have that in my back pocket. And what was really valuable, and I think what really helped me the most about it, was being able to be in the room with great theater artists long before I was able to be in there with them as a writer. You know, I sat with Bill Finn and Jim Levine for you know years working on New Brain and also working on Muscle, uh, which never happened, but you know, I, I was in the room watching those shows happen and I sat with Hal before Hal and I did Parade. I was the music director for a show called The Petrified Friends and so I was sort of around Hal and around the process. I was the first rehearsal pianist for Kiss of the Spider Woman. So I was always around the process. And uh, you know, uh, uh, to be particularly timely, there's just something about being in the room where it happens. And uh, it, it, I think that, as much as anything, uh, is what helped. It helped the writing because if you know how the writing is going to go out into the world, if you know what's going to happen in that rehearsal room and on that stage and in those theaters and during those previews, I think that helps shape the writing. That does sort of change the way that you uh, you see it going because you know what's you know what's possible, you know what's impossible, you know what's impossible, but you want to do anyway. There's, you know, there's just sort of all of that room in there, and I you know I happen to like. The real fact of the matter is I just like music. I mean, I like doing all of that stuff. I like being conversant with musicians. I like you know, hanging out with the band and, and uh, figuring out how the music is supposed to take off in certain ways. So, uh, and I like being able to do it for other people. Um, it's a little weird now, like Prince of Broadway, uh, I, you know, I'm doing it because Hal asked me to do it, obviously, and, and uh, I'm not gonna say no to Hal. Uh, but it, it, it's a little weird working on something that is not my music. I'm, the, the reason I did it with Prince of Broadway is that I'm, it's John Kander and it's Stephen Sondheim and it's Jerry Bach and I mean it's, it's, the, you know, it's the best music in the world. I'm not, I have no problem working on that music. Uh, but I, uh, I had to step back a lot from the Toulouse-Lautrec piece uh, that they're doing up at Goodspeed now, which I did all the musical adaptation and I rewrote all the lyrics into English and I, I did a lot of it. And then at a certain point it was taking up a lot of my time and I said it's not my show. It will ultimately be Charles Aznavour's show, and I'm going to have a credit on it, and I'm going to get a royalty for it, and that's all fine. But I don't, I don't think I can spend any more of my time on this because you know shows take a long time to get up. And I've been working on that show. What I think it's called My Paris now, but I think I was, you know we've been working on it for three and a half or four years, and for a show that's not my show, that's enough. That's good. Bueno. Uh, talking about the last five years, I know that you know with the film coming out, obviously there was a lot of work in terms of how that was going to translate and maybe differences between the two. What did you find? Did you find anything surprising about the process of getting a musical of yours on <coughs> screen um, versus on stage? Was there anything that you know was different between the stage version and film version um, that you know would be an interesting part of adapting that? Um, I, you know, I'm. I'm still amazed the movie exists, so I, uh, it's hard for me to sort of have any context other than, uh, we're talking about a movie of the last <laughs> five years. I don't know, who knew that was good? So, you know, there was actually a movie of the last five years. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's largely successful. I, it, it, it does, I, it, it didn't require a whole lot from me in terms of the adaptation. I mean, there were, uh, you know, Rich would, would write a, a draft of the screenplay and I would give him some notes and then he'd go back and he'd revise, you know, and we just sort of went back and forth with it for a long time, but most of the screenplay consists of stage directions because largely the lyrics are exactly the same. You know, there, there's very little that I changed. There are a couple of places where he said, because I've got them both in the scene, what can they do? And, you know, also uh, Rich didn't want to do it uh, in period. The show still exists as a, a show that's supposed to take place in the late 90s, but the movie takes place, you know, when it was filmed, uh, you know, now, a year and a half ago. Um, and so because of that, uh, there were some things that didn't make as much sense, uh, you know, about how my original lyrics work with this. So I, I made some adjustments to that. And I think 
there are some things about the story that don't make as much sense because it's now a, a part of what part of how the the show functions is that it was a little bit harder to communicate when there weren't cell phones and there wasn't the internet and that people could get lost a little bit more easily. Uh, and I think you have to jump through a, a, a couple more hoops to pull that off uh, with the show now. Um, but uh, yeah, but no, that, I mean, I, it, uh, 13, which we're uh, working on now for the movie, uh, is Obviously, I, I'm much more open to you know turn it into whatever you know. It, so that's you know we're blowing that up and turn it. That's going to be like it'll feel like if it ever gets made, that'll feel like a movie, you know. And, but the last five years really feels like they took the show and they filmed it, which is really what I that was all I was willing to let anybody do anyway. So. Uh, so you, of course, you do a lot of musical comedy, musical play, adaptation, not ad adaptation. It's when you look at, you know, the canon of musical theater history, even, you know, a lot of people kind of stick to one. Uh, is there a reason that you feel like that excites you um, to do kind of all of those things? When we were, uh, when we were doing the Bridges of Madison County, Marsha uh, Norman said to me, um, <laughs> there was one day where like something needed to get done and she, she was like starting to get nervous about how it had to happen, and I just handed it to her. And she looked at me and she said, Jason, you are basically competent. <laughs> she said it in the, in the, and meant it in the highest compliment, because in the, in the sense that a lot of people in the theater, and probably a lot of people in any business, but we know the people in the theater, and a lot of them cannot function. They cannot get from one end of the day to the other, and they just manage to sort of fart out these little bits of genius every now and then, and we're all like, oh, thank God, we got a little bit, just take it, go. And I never wanted to be a crazy person. I never wanted to be, I didn't want to be one of those, like, artists who had to be sort of t catered to, intended to, because I, all I could do was sort of one very weird specialized thing. I, it just, it holds no appeal to me. I wanted to be basically competent. And so for me, I want to write. I want to write all kinds of things. I want to be the person who can write whatever anyone comes up with. And I want to be able to orchestrate it. And I want to be, because I'm basically competent. I, it, it turns out to matter a lot to me that I'm the guy who can do the job. Uh, and uh, I take doing the job very seriously. And now I'm at a point in my life where I can, there are certain jobs I don't have to take, and that's nice. But uh, up until now, I, you know, I've always been, I just offer me the job. I, I'm happy to take it. I, you know, I, I, I can do it. I can do the thing. I, I don't need to be sort of cobbled and sequestered. I can actually just do the thing that you need me to do. So uh, there is something about all of these shows where it was me wanting to be able to say, look, I, I can write a musical comedy. I can adapt a movie. <coughs> I can write a dark thing. I can write uh, you know, a, a little chamber piece. I can do sort of all this. I can write for 13 kids. That's what I can do. I, you know, it doesn't really matter. I, if, 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 it, if I if it rings to me in here, I'm going to be able to, to make it work. Uh, and I even have some things that I'm working on now where I'm doing it just because I'm like, no, I can do it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> we can't ask what those things are, can we? Uh, you can ask. I just can't tell you. <laughs> um, all, all will be revealed in time. <laughs> all things in time. Um, so talking about Parade, because of course we're at Lincoln Center, uh, what were the particular challenges of doing that show, which of course is so big and you know has so much to say um, with you know kind of audiences who might not have been expecting I know that um, like what were the changes you made in terms of during previews what, were there things that were adjusted because of the audience what was that experience like um, I, did anyone here actually see the original production no um, oh you did yes, yes. thank you uh, we're all very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, uh, it was a weird production, to be honest. Uh, it was big, but it was also very slow. It sort of lumbered along a lot, uh, which was hard. Um, but, uh, I'm sorry, I'm focusing on the siren. Um, <laughs> this is what it's like to be around a musician. Um, but I, uh, the, 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 <laughs> Take a break. <laughs> Think about your favorite song from Parade. <laughs> it has a siren. <laughs> um, Parade was a little bit tricky because I was working with uh, with Alfred in the first place, who was 
you know, 30 some odd years older than I was, and I had a Pulitzer Prize, and you know, that was all of that. And then I was working with Hal, and, and Hal is a formidable presence under any circumstances, and even now Hal is a formidable presence, but you know, I walked into Hal's office for the first time, and there were 20 Tony Awards. You know, and that's, uh, you know, and they're just, they were just staring at you when you walk in, they're just like, ah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and Hal, Hal doesn't think he's impossible, and Hal is fucking impossible. And that, that is all kinds of challenges wrapped up into one. And with Parade, Hal had a very specific idea of what it was he wanted to do, and Hal always has a very specific idea of what he wants to do. And when I'm confronted with people who have very specific ideas, I tend to say, okay, great, you've got an idea, good, we'll just go with that, and we'll do it. And that, that's, you know, because I have very specific musical ideas, and I'm, I'm expecting everyone to get out of my way so we can do those. Uh, and so he had ideas about the staging, and he had ideas about the pace of the show, and he had ideas about plot things, and the places he wanted cuts, and all of that, and I would just go, okay, great. And, uh, you know, it wasn't as easy as that. But, uh, you know, we, we got into previews, and we didn't change anything. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, there was a day where we put in about four minutes of cuts, and one of them, uh, we, we had changed some scenes involving Leo's lawyer. Uh, not for the better. And that was the sum total of the changes we made during previews. And I think that at a certain point, Hal, we got through tech, and we got the show up on stage, and Hal said, great, that's it. And the audience was not responding particularly well, uh, but Hal was not interested in figuring out what it was we could do to, to make the show ex more accessible to the audience. And in truth, I don't know that we could have done the kind of work we did when Rob directed the show 10 years later. I, I, there were things that, you know, Alfred and I had been begging Hal to cut all those years before, and Hal was like, no, no, we're keeping it, we're keeping it, and Rob was like, oh, please, let's take it out, it's gone. Uh, and so the show is infinitely more streamlined now than it was uh, when Hal directed it. But I, even if we had taken all of those things out, even if we had gotten that done, there were certain conceptual things about the show that were always gonna be really rough on an audience. And there was something about the Lincoln Center audience which uh, you know, you hear it a lot, people who do shows at the Beaumont especially will talk about how complicated that audience is uh, for new work. Because they are an older audience and they are cranky and they, <laughs> they will tell you. Uh, and we had, I mean, just in the like dumb anecdote thing, there was one night at the end of, uh, you know, the first act was about an hour and 40 minutes. And most of the way through the, uh, through the first act, the, Mrs. Fagan, uh, Malaski had her, uh, her song, When My Child Will Forgive Me. And at the end of the song, she goes, and so I forgive you. And she looks at me and she says, Jew. And it's supposed to be this moment where the whole audience sort of does this, because we managed to stay away from that word for the last couple of hours. And uh, there was one woman in the front row, uh, an elderly lady in the front row, who, and I, I totally get it, stood up, took her pocketbook, and she said, well, I've had enough of this, and walked up the entirety of I mean, because she was in the front and walked all the way up while the rest of the scene is trying to go on. And this, who was, and she was not moving swiftly because she was an older lady. And it was, and, and that was, she was the microcosm of the Lincoln Center audience. Well, I've had enough of this. Was, and we, we got that, I sat in the house and that's what I felt coming back at me the entire time. Well, I've had enough of this. So I don't know that there was a whole lot we could have done to satisfy that particular crowd. And I think Hal felt that very early on. I think Hal was also defeated by the, the thrust. I think that was not a, a space he felt comfortable directing in. Ultimately, you know, he was a guy who spent his whole life directing on proscenios. And so to have to direct in a thrust, I think he was a little like, ah. So I'm not sure he was ever totally nuts about the way the show looked and moved. It was great in the rehearsal room. I mean, everyone always says that, but it really, it, it, it had a coherence in the rehearsal room that I don't think it ever managed to get on stage. And for all that, I thought it was a beautiful production. I, I really, I loved it, and I was so proud of it, and I, I thought it was so great, and I thought it was unfair that people didn't appreciate, you know, all of that. But uh, the hindsight of it is that the, the show works better uh, when it's tighter. I mean, you know, even the version we did at Avery Fisher, which was still at Avery Fisher with 200 people in the choir, but, uh, you know, it moved like lightning, and that's sort of what the show has to do, I think, with the story it's telling is so, it's so awful that if you get ponderous or preachy about it, you're, you're in big trouble. And there were moments of ponderousness and preachiness, certainly. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, that reminds me so much of the cabaret story about Misguide and them revising the Jewish lyric. Um, which it's is not Misguide. It's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the end of uh, If You Can See Her. If yeah. You Can See Her, the, of course. Um, the gorilla, which actually is a question of, you know, I've read that with cabaret, how Prince, of course, it was, you know, World War II and that time in, you know, Europe, uh, but that he was, you know, there was a lot about the civil rights movement, which was where the country was when cabaret came out. Um, and I wondered if there were any conversations during parade about, you know, we're writing about this time, but this is where we see the parallels kind of. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't so much that. There was one great line that uh, the governor's wife says uh, at some point late in the show, she says, I'd rather be, uh, I'd rather be wife to a fine ex-governor than first lady to a chicken. And that was uh, that came out right as Monica Lewinsky was all sort of floating around the headlines. And so we got applause from that line every night. I wasn't sure what they were applauding exactly, but uh, but uh, it was clearly that was the sense was like, because uh, we, we always were, the, the, the Governor and Mrs. Slayton always were not as the Clintons. They were always this very smooth political couple, and you know, which they weren't, in fact, in real life. But in, in, uh, in parade, they, they very much were. Uh, you know, real. They, they were real good at the politics of it, and real good at the, the, the social element of it, and staying light on their feet, and and, uh, and all of that. So we definitely, that was definitely part of it. But I, you know, the story of parade is so it's so bleak, but it's also so elementally American that you don't have to look particularly hard to find parallels for any of it at any given time. I mean, cabaret, because it took place in Nazi Germany, you know, it, it, could, it could bear the weight of allegory a little bit more. The parade doesn't feel allegorical. Parade feels like, this is, this is our country. Congratulations, this is what, this is what we got. I mean, I, I, I think it's why parade is important, and I always sort of resist saying any musical is important, but I think parade is important because of what it says, this is, this is where we live. These are the older red hills of home. It, it, it includes all of those things. It, uh, it's a beautiful place where people can do terrible things to each other. <laughs> uh, so of course you live in the concert world as well as the theatrical world, which I find really interesting um, because I think also, and I'm, I can say this, it, it seems to have opened that door for a lot of musical theater writers who kind of learn from concerts what to do in shows or you know what not to do, all of that kinds of things. Um, do you feel like one feeds the other in a way that impacts your writing at all? Do you find that you see, oh, you know, this is how an audience reacted to this song, that's gonna change maybe how it goes into the musical, or it's totally different, how does that? It is totally different, but I, I, I'm not sure that it's, it's to my benefit that I uh, use the concerts to, to work through the material, because uh, I, there's a danger that the material gets uh, concerty, because uh, they're, they're very different venues. Um, I would much rather end up writing songs that, you know, both are theatrically effective and that I can put in the concerts and that people respond to. I feel like that's kind of the part of my job, musical theater-wise, is not just to write these big overarching musicals, but also to have things in them that I can put out in the world. And, and you know, that's part of what people like about musicals is there are songs in them that, you know, sort of, you know what a song is because it starts at the beginning and it ends at the end. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think, this is Judy Prince, I remember, said this to me uh, when she first met me. She said, oh, it's so great you write songs because all these other people who just imitate Steve and they don't write any goddamn songs. And I sort of knew what she meant because there were a whole lot of songs, especially in the 90s when people were, you know, the new musical theater writers uh, at, the, at that time, uh, <coughs> did tend to write sort of scores. Uh, and they, you know, that things got very operatic and, uh, you know, very, you know, structurally very, pulled out and stretched around and, and all of that. And they could be really interesting, but they weren't all that gratifying to sit in the middle of uh, if you were just a, a non-musician in the audience. And I, I, of course, because I wanted to be Billy Joel, I was thinking more like, no, a song is a song, and then I'm gonna put this song in a musical, and it will still have the, the whole shape of that. So I think Judy said, that her point was, when Steve started, Steve started by writing songs, and then he turned into a guy who could write Sweeney Todd, but it's based on the fact that he starts by writing songs. Uh, and so she was excited about that. So I think that's definitely still true for me and for the way I work. I haven't written anything that is as uh, ambitious musically as Parade is. I'm working on one thing now uh, that will be pretty deeply weird on a musical level. But um, but other than that, everything else has been, I mean, even the Bridges of Madison County is really much more straightforward uh, than, uh, than Parade is, um, which I, it's fine. But um, I, I like being able to do the, the songs and the concerts, and I felt it with A League of Their Own, 
uh, I had a, a hard time, I still am having a very hard time finding my way into it, into it because the movie works very well and this is not a situation that I've had to deal with before. You know, Honeymoon in Vegas, the movie works fine, but it wanted to sing and people don't know it you know, that well. You know, who, you know, who's seen Honeymoon in Vegas, the movie, all that recently, unless it was on you know, TBS or something. But, um, but with the League of Their Own, people have that movie memorized, and they, they are gonna walk in and wanna see it, and I've had a lot of trouble finding my way to what is my own voice that still honors the fact that people are gonna want that movie to be that. It's, it's really tricky. I don't know that I would've taken it on if I hadn't been hired to do it. I was asked, and I thought, oh, let me think of that. If I, it could be fun, but it's really hard. But I have found that I wrote a lot of songs that I then would be coming up on one of my subculture concerts, and I'd be like, oh, I'll do one of these songs. And I'd be like, huh, this doesn't feel like a song. This doesn't feel like a thing I can do. And I thought, you know what? That's, that's a problem I'm having with this show, is it's not, it's not landing that way. And then once I started finding songs that I was like, oh, that's what, that feels like a song I could do at the concert. That feels like a song that I could give to the, one of the girls and make she could sing it and be like, oh, that's a moment. Then I, I started feeling like, oh, right, I know how this is going to work now. But every, every song is still hard, hard, hard. Um, so the concerts in that way are, are useful to me, but also the concerts have always been useful to me because the shows don't run for very long, and uh, people don't get to see the material live, uh, you know, sort of horse's mouth version, at least, if I don't do it. And for a long time, uh, you know, you certainly, you weren't gonna see a production of Songs for a New World that was done by people who could really sing it, or, you know, a pianist who could really play it, unless I happened to be coming through town. <laughs> And so, uh, for me, the concerts became very valuable just to disseminate the work, because there was no other way to really get it out there. Um, and they still feel like that to me, and uh, you know, part of why, you know, uh, with my solo album, you know, that, that was sort of the basis of the concert work for a long time, which was getting that out of the world, because that is how you get albums sold, is you go out and you perform the songs. So for me, the, the shows, uh, it all, it all uh, built into the same thing. I mean, I'm interested when you talk about how uh, you know I inspired uh, that whole idea of doing concerts and all that, because it's true, that wasn't a thing that a lot of people did before then. But I'm interested in how it, how it plays out for Joe and how it plays out for Nick and, and sort of in the big picture stuff of, of playing shows down there, because that, uh, it hasn't translated for either of them yet, and I, I'm interested in how it will <coughs> translate to them eventually, because it, the, the trick about doing the concerts is, is you can get very comfortable working in small venues. Mm -hmm. And there's something about knowing how to <coughs> swing for very far fences that uh, you have to learn how to do at a certain point. And I'm just interested in when that happens. Uh, you guys should check out the subculture schedule because it is really exciting. I remember when I first moved to New York, I would see Jason wherever he was, at Burnley, of anywhere. Um, and it, it is, I feel like it's educational to know this is a song from this musical, this is a song not from a musical, and to see them both in that context, it's pretty educational and exciting. Um, I think we're almost done. Do I have one more question? I have one more. Uh, is there anything that you're working on now that we haven't talked about that you'd want to tell us about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. Okay. <laughs> then that's that's that. Um, great. <laughs> Did I get really boring? I felt like I got really boring every once in a while. I'm sorry. It's, just, it's early in the morning. I'm, I don't feel as engaging as I usually am. So uh, as last time, we have about six songs. Um, we'll perform the song. Guess we'll give some feedback. Uh, we have the piano here. Um, everyone has a piano player today. Is that right? Everyone good. No one needs to. Um, well, somebody has a bass player, apparently, so. <laughs> so the first uh, group is uh, Nathan, James, and Heather. Oh, I leave. <laughs> and again, I'll keep the camera on, but if you want me not to film, just tell me and I'll turn it off. Give me a copy of the spill later. Yeah. So we need some audience participation here. So one, we need, can, can anyone beatbox and makeshift percussion? Uh, no? Okay, second set of audience participation. Can someone hold the music up for the bass player? Yeah. There are music standards. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you.
with her right now. Yeah, Else to the game show, the musical. <laughs> Do you want to copy the score? Sure. Um, this is the other part. No, I said okay. You're on. Sorry, we, we haven't done this all together before. Yeah. Also, I'm not a bass player. <laughs> well, you are now. <laughs> no chance in hell, the pop-up show. It's here when you come, and it's gone when you go. of the game show who is the Mephistopheles equivalent of this were Faust. Right. Uh, I, without knowing a whole lot about uh, what else is going on or what, uh, what's happening here, um, I, I, you know, it, it's hard to sort of get around that particular uh, very strange presentation, so I'm uh, uh, Picky Unity is going to uh, come back to bite you in the ass one of these days, but uh, that's it. Yeah, I understand. There should be a word like that. There isn't. Yeah, no, no, it, it's fine. It's, it, the question always is about lyrics, whether the audience is going to be able to catch it when it goes by or not. Because right. if they don't, you don't get another chance to go back and tell them that they, they missed it or not. But, um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't feel like I know enough about uh, what the story is to to have any real thoughts about how the lyric fits into all of that. Um, I would say that Nathan, as far as, I, just on a technical level, uh, you must play yes. piano. Um, no, not piano. I play oboe and violin. 
you play oboe and violin. All right. Well, I'm learning piano. Right. Uh, you know, you would be served. I think this is one of the things that the the concert stuff is about. Is you would be served by knowing how to serve your material. You know, you would be served by sort of the, just that. How do I make sure that I'm always presenting my stuff so everyone gets what it is that I want to do? Because I sort of I can see what you want to do on the page, but I'm not sure that that was a representation of what you wanted it to be particularly. So that's just a thing to sort of ponder as you are getting older. How do I want to make sure that whenever I present something, it always feels like the thing that I wanted to say? Um, <coughs> which is just useful. I like I like all the, the modulating through it. I think that's, that's uh, pretty cool that it just keeps uh, going up. Um, do I have any other like immediate thoughts? I, you know, I'm not sure I do. It'll uh, um, it will, it'll be interesting to see what the the rest of the piece is, um, and how it all functions. I guess my one interesting question that I have is what is the uh, what is the protagonist doing while all this is going on? He's horrified. <laughs> and for how long is he horrified? Well, what happens is he was caught in the middle of a, an embezzlement. He woke up in the middle of the night, was about to embezzle a half a million bucks in the bank. He's uh, vacillating on whether to do it or not because he's basically a good guy. But what's and, happening on stage while but, yeah, So it, this is the, the, what happened just before the song. Mm -hmm. So he was going to press the button when the sulfurous change occurs. As he wakes, is he asleep? Who is this guy? What is he doing? And the, the one of the aims of lyrics was put it, each verse essentially puts out a possibility, an event that could happen. And the name of the show is No Chance in Hell, of course. So at the end of the thing, he's saying, is this going to happen now? There's no chance in uh, hell. Is it, is it possible? What's going on here? It's to create a sinister uh, uh, feeling of anything that happened. Who is this guy? He sounds crazy. He sounds evil. There's a sardonic sense of wit. It's really introducing the MC and creating right. an atmosphere in a <coughs> minute and a half if we could do that. That was really what the goal was. Yeah. yeah. With images. And that's yeah. I, uh, my point is just this. Uh, the audience doesn't care about the MC. The audience cares about this protagonist who you've spent time with. And so the thing that will be an interesting thing for you to try and deal with is what is the protagonist doing? It's not just the director's problem to figure out how to throw the protagonist around on stage while he's getting attacked by sulfurous creatures. But how are you as the writers dealing with what this person is doing for what is two minutes or two and a half minutes or however long the song goes on where he is being sort of all of this is coming at him. There's only so much passivity that an audience is particularly interested in watching, and only so much passivity that a character can really take on and have an audience connect to it at any given point. What we want to be watching is the protagonist's journey, and there's a real danger in making other people more interesting than the protagonist, which I have learned on several shows. So, so I'm I'm just, just, I'll just ask a question. So, so how do we do this? We just introduced the protagonist in a, in a very you know, uh, quick way in, with his dilemma. And it's really going to be a war between these two people. That's what the show is going to be about for 20 minutes we have. Mm -hmm. So this is a way of establishing the, the other guy. I, mean, I don't know what, I'm, well, you probably have the problems for us to solve. But I mean, it's, uh, that's what we're trying to do is get the other half of the, the uh, equation on the board. And then they, then they go at it for the rest of the play. Mm -hmm. I, 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 it is just, it is on you to always be thinking about what that protagonist is doing. And often what I, when, the, when the problem comes up and starts feeling like I don't know how to solve it within the context, it may be because it's the wrong idea for the song. I'm not saying that it, that's this case. I don't, I have no idea. But there are plenty of times where I have written a song that was totally great, and I look back and I was trying to figure out how to knit other characters into it or how to get a plot point done or something like that, and I thought, oh, the reason I can't do it is because I wrote the wrong song. It's a good song, but I was wrong. Can I give you one final question, which is, one of the things, for the, one thought we had was breaking that up into each of these four of these uh, verses, I guess, for this section. Either cut one or two, or but in between have uh, him saying something, or engaging the guy in conversation between verses. In other words, have the have the. You, know, you might get away with a little of that, but but I, you know, again, the song is supposed to do what the song does. So if if, the, if you need dialogue to do what the song does, then the song isn't doing what the song has to do. Got so it. I, but I, I think a combination of those things is probably going to be important. But uh, it, it might be worth thinking about whether one of these sections, you know, at the moment, I, I didn't really feel the structure entirely, but it felt like three A sections that sort of come on top of each other, right? I mean, that's 
There's sort of there's a verse, there's a verse, there's a verse. Verse, 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 verse. section verse. Yeah. All right. I didn't really feel when the B section came, but that's I that's the one time through it. But uh, but it may be that one of those is supposed to go to the protagonist. It may be that the B section is supposed to be the protagonist and the responding to it. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, things to think about. Yeah, that's really good because we were we were supposed to be thinking of MC's action, we weren't thinking of Frank's action. Okay. Yeah, right. Something to consider. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. project is called Making a Living. I'm the book writer and lyricist. My name is Ed Levy. Philip Romano is our composer. Hannah Williams is one of our actress singers and she's our dramaturg. Um, we are performing the opening number of Making a Living. So the only intro it needs is that Hannah skips onto the stage and sings directly to the audience. <laughs> straight ahead. <laughs> 
<laughs> there, you know, there are some things folks, that I would pick on with you about how we're transitioning, especially once we get into the 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 one thing, yeah. thing, you know, that thing that all feels like blah. Uh, and I, at the end, I didn't feel like you actually delivered. An ending in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, <laughs> you know, resolution is a, a thing that we all feel when things resolve. Uh, the, the actual tonal resolution of the, the two going to the five to the one, and we all say, "Oh, great, we did that." And I, I think maybe even yeah. if you intended that, you didn't necessarily. Yeah, no, the ending and the transition to be part of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I, so so tell me what happens after this. What what, what happens after this? is that she goes to her apartment with her two artist roommates and the, um, the leaseholder of the apartment who's a hedge fund manager. And they have a struggle where the hedge fund manager decides she's going to evict them all because they're not paying the rent. And then she goes out, she, she leaves in response to the, this eviction. She comes back. She holds up a newspaper. She says, there's new legislation. People are going to get paid what they're worth. <laughs> Teachers are going to get paid the most. Hedge fund managers are going to get paid much less. And artists are going to be in between. That's basically <laughs> the story. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, so I don't have any thoughts, therefore, about how the opening is supposed to lead us through that particular thing. But um, you know, in the in the idea that the opening is supposed to set up the rules for what the rest of the story is going to be, uh, what you don't ever say anything about here is anything about her relative value, and if what the what you're going to say at the end is, we all are going to get what we're worth, then that idea should be in here someplace, cool. which is the reason I'm happy to lose my job is because I wasn't being treated as I was worthy. I was not being valued. And at the end of the piece, I'm going to be valued, and therefore, in the, uh, in the most traditional Greek storytelling way, I've set up the problem and then I'm going to solve the problem. But otherwise, her, her joy at having lost her job uh, seems a little bit uh, vague because it's not really going to go to any place other than everyone sitting around the apartment and saying, oh, we're going to get evicted now. I, it, it just, well, anyway, so that's your, that's your problem to solve. But, um, but there, I, you know, I, I like the... I like the rhymes, I, you know, there's, there's a lot of fun things that happen and that's all good and you get laughs and getting laughed is never a bad thing, so that's all good. Um, uh, you know, the, always the danger of she walks out on stage and talks directly to the audience is that you're setting up a, 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 a method of storytelling whereby you don't actually have to show anything, you can just tell us at all. Uh, and so the minute you start with the fluorescent lights shining on his balding head, I, you know, there's not a whole lot for we don't have to be in a theater for that to happen. We can just be in a very small room and you know, we're putting on headphones and all that. But there's something about why we're writing in a theater and what's supposed to happen there. And that this may be a more interesting song if what happens is the lights come up and the boss says to her, you're fired, and does that. And then the rest of the song is her responding to the words, you're fired, by saying, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. That's fantastic. And you know, that may be a more active and interesting song, watching her pack up the office, watching her you know, leave, watching her sort of build her life, and oh, this cactus, you can come with me because now we have a new life ahead of us. We have a whole new world in store. That may be more fun than her just sort of singing to the audience about a thing that already happened. That's great. Thank you. That's what I'm here for. All right. <laughs> for this song. Okay. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so here's what's going on. During the Civil War, several hundred women donned men's clothing and signed up to defend the Union. 
Most spent the rest of their lives as men. But Sarah Emma Edmonds did not. She was an otherwise seemingly ordinary woman who enlisted as Private Frank Thompson, was never caught out, afterwards resumed life as a woman, married and raised a family. This musical is based on her memoir, Nurse and Spy in the Union Army. This song takes place about two-thirds of the way through the show after we've already seen her on Spy 